In this video, we discuss the causes of acute upper airway obstruction in detail. The main differentials are croup, epiglottitis, exudative tracheitis, retropharyngeal cellulitis, and abscess. Acute upper airway obstruction is most commonly due to infective or inflammatory disorders and foreign bodies, and we cover infective causes here. Most common inflammatory disorders include croup, epiglottitis, exudative tracheitis, and retropharyngeal cellulitis and abscess. Croup or acute laryngotracheobronchitis is the most common cause of acute upper airway obstruction in young children. The peak incidence is seen between six months and three years of age with mean age being one year of age. This is due to viral infection, respiratory syncytial or parainfluenza virus, and is usually a benign, self-limited disease. Redundant mucosa in the subglottic region is inflamed, swells, and encroaches upon the airway. The children are present with barking coughs and intermittent inspiratory strider. Diagnosis is usually made clinically. Radiography is not to confirm the diagnosis, but to exclude other serious causes of upper airway obstruction. Frontal radiographs show loss of the normal shoulders, lateral convexities, of the subglottic trachea secondary to symmetric subglottic edema. The subglottic trachea becomes long and thin, with the narrow portion extending more inferiorly than the level of the piriform sinuses giving an inverted V, or a church steeple, wine bottle, sign. Distension of the hyperpharynx is also seen due to the patient's attempt at decreasing airway resistance. Lateral radiographs show a narrowing or loss of definition of the lumen of the subglottic trachea or hypopharyngeal overdistension. The epiglottis and areopiglottic folds appear normal. Treatment and prognosis. Croup is usually a self-limiting disease. It has a good overall long-term prognosis. Conservative measures, including nebulized epinephrine, epinephrine, and corticosteroids, are commonly used. Differential diagnoses include tracheal foreign body aspiration, esophageal foreign body, angioneurotic edema, epiglottic cysts, epiglottitis, this is an enlargement of the epiglottis and areopiglottic folds. The appearance is named as thumb sign or omega sign, usually older children. Congenital subglottic stenosis, different clinical presentation. Subglottic hemangioma, epiglottitis, Epiglottitis is a life-threatening condition caused by inflammation of the epiglottis and areopiglottic folds, which leads to acute airway obstruction and requires emergent intubation. Most cases of epiglottitis are caused by Haemophilus influenzae and are now preventable by immunization, HIV vaccine. Other causes include direct extension of adjacent infections like dental infection, tonsillitis, laryngopiocele, and skin cellulitis. Inflammatory causes include sarcoidosis. The incidence of epiglottitis has now dramatically reduced with the HIBB vaccine. Children are usually presented with toxic, abrupt onset of strider, dysphagia, fever, difficulty speaking, muffling or changes in the voice, restlessness, and an increase in respiratory distress when recumbent. The peak age of incidence was 3.5 years. If the diagnosis is not made on physical examination, a single lateral radiograph of the neck should be obtained while the patient is erect or in whatever position that allows the patient to breathe comfortably. Children with epiglottitis should never be made to lie supine against their will to obtain a radiograph because it can result in acute airway obstruction and, potentially, death. On the lateral radiograph, there is marked thickening of the epiglottis and areopiglottic folds called as the thumb sign, and the hyperpharynx may be overdistended. The symmetric subglottic narrowing can be seen if a frontal X-ray is available. An omega epiglottis, either a variant of normal or in the setting of laryngomalacia, similar appearance, and can be mistaken for epiglottitis. Absence of thickening of the areopiglottic folds can be helpful in making this differentiation. CT findings of epiglottitis include swelling and low attenuation edema of the epiglottis 
and areopiglottic folds associated with inflammatory stranding in adjacent fat. Treatment and prognosis. Treatment must be expeditious given the life-threatening nature of the condition. Patients should be kept upright in a comfortable position. Do the airway management with oxygen therapy. Early tracheal intubation by specialist staff, if ET tube placement is impossible because of an inflamed epiglottis. Emergency needle cricothyroidotomy may need to be performed. Four fluids. Four steroids and antibiotics. Exudative tracheitis. This is also known as bacterial tracheitis or membranous laryngotracheobronchitis. This is another uncommon but potentially life-threatening cause of acute upper airway obstruction. This is characterized by a purulent infection of the trachea in which exudative plaques form along the tracheal walls, like in diphtheria. Affected children are older and more ill than croup, typically 6 to 10 years. It is unclear whether the disease is a primary bacterial infection or a secondary bacterial infection following a viral infection. A linear soft tissue filling defect, a membrane, seen within the airway on radiography is the most characteristic finding. A plaque-like irregularity of the tracheal wall is also highly suspicious. Non-adherent mucus is a differential diagnosis, but repeat radiograph after coughing out, it will be clear. Other findings include symmetric or asymmetric subglottic narrowing in a child too old typically to have croup and irregularity or loss of definition of the tracheal wall. If one of these exudative membranes is sloughed into the lumen, it can lead to airway occlusion and respiratory arrest. These patients are often evaluated endoscopically, the exudative membranes are stripped, and elective endotracheal intubation is performed. Retropharyngeal cellulitis and abscess. This is a pyogenic infection of the retropharyngeal space that usually follows a recent pharyngitis or upper respiratory tract infection. Children are usually present with sudden onset of fever, stiff neck, dysphagia, and occasionally strider. Most affected children are young, with more than half of the cases occurring between 6 and 12 months of age. On lateral radiography, there is a thickening of the retropharyngeal soft tissues. In a normal infant or young child, the retropharyngeal soft tissue thickness is should not exceed the anterior to posterior diameter of the cervical vertebral bodies. If these soft tissues are thicker, an abnormality should be suspected. However, in infants who have short necks, this can be a pseudo-thickening of the retropharyngeal soft tissues when the lateral radiograph is obtained without the neck is well extended. It is best to repeat the lateral radiograph with the neck placed in full extension. However, for differentiation from a prevertebral abscess, Careful evaluation of the vertebral bodies and disc spaces is important. Fluoroscopy can also be used to evaluate whether the pseudo-thickening is persistent. The only radiographic feature that can differentiate abscess from cellulitis is the identification of gas within the retropharyngeal soft tissues. CT is to define the extent of disease and to help to predict cases in which a drainable fluid collection is present. CT shows a low attenuation, well-defined area with an enhancing rim that is suspicious for a drainable fluid collection. Cellulitis without abscess is actually more common than the presence of a drainable abscess. MRI has superior contrast resolution than CT and is able to interrogate the retropharyngeal space. T1 images show central low to intermediate signal. T2 images show central high signal. T1C plus GD shows peripheral enhancement. DWI increased values indicative of restricted diffusion. When considering treatment and prognosis. Surgical drainage. Intravenous antibiotics. Complications of retropharyngeal cellulitis and abscess are. Posterior extension to prevertebral space, decitis osteomyelitis, epidural abscess. Lateral extension involving the carotid artery leading to hemorrhage, pseudoaneurysm, thrombosis, stenosis, and jugular vein thrombosis. Anterior compression and compromise of the airway. 
inferior extension into the mediastinum resulting in mediastinitis. Systemic dissemination and development of sepsis. Grisel syndrome. Lemierre syndrome. Differential diagnoses are retropharyngeal cellulitis, same pathology but no abscess formation. Retropharyngeal edema, hypotenuation without a well-defined or enhancing rim. Prevertebral abscess, usually secondary to decitis osteomyelitis. Retropharyngeal hematoma. Caps triad. This is usually in adults. Retropharyngeal effusion secondary to acute calcific prevertebral tendinitis. No marginal enhancement. Calcification may be seen in the longus capitates and longus collar muscles. Next one is mass involving retropharyngeal space, like hemangioma, tumor. The last one is retropharyngeal pseudo thickening, especially in young children. If you like the video, you can like it, comment it, and share it with your friends. If you are not subscribed yet, please subscribe and click the bell button.